God of life, You reach out to us amid our fears with the wounded hands of Your risen Son. By Your Spirit's breath, revive our faith in Your mercy and strengthen us to be the body of Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with You and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. I'd like to begin at the end of today's gospel reading. Listen once more, please. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. So that you may come to believe. Do you see what John is doing here? He's opening the door to the story of Jesus and inviting us all in. He wants us to understand that this Jesus thing is not about them back then. But rather, it's about us here and now. I invite you to accept that invitation if you haven't already done so and take a step inside this new world of the resurrection to see where you might find yourself. Today's reading begins where we left off last week. By the way, I hope you appreciate that I did not begin with the pop quiz on your homework assignment from last week. I do know that a number of you were very diligent about that, and I am delighted. We left off with Mary Magdalene, fresh from the cemetery, returning to the disciples to announce to them, I have seen the Lord. I didn't mention it last week, but John's verb for announce is a fascinating choice. It's the only time he uses it in his entire gospel. It's the Greek angelo, the root word for angel or messenger of God. And it's a way of showing, I think, how extraordinary Mary's role is in the gospel, how her message is absolutely life-changing. More on that later. John's next scene is that same first Easter day, but now in the evening. Remember, see where you fit in this scene. The disciples, he doesn't say how many, but only that Thomas was not there. The disciples were gathered together in fear behind locked doors. 
Now, in some ways, that fear was understandable. Huh? Their teacher, leader, had just been executed as a criminal, convicted by the religious leaders, executed by the state. They might well wonder if they were next in line. But at the same time, you have to ask what bearing Mary's news might have had on them, the news that Jesus lived. I mean, after all, no one had ever been crucified before than lived to tell about it. Well, that's the scene. Can you imagine or begin to at least the anxiety, turmoil, the uncertainty of that first Easter night gathering? And then John says that in spite of the locked doors, Jesus appeared among them. And the first words out of his mouth are, Peace be with you. Now that was the usual common greeting back then, still is today in the Middle East. But you can be sure it was absolutely packed with power that night. He says it twice, in fact. And in the saying of those words, Jesus imparts God's shalom, God's peace, to overcome their fears, to quell the turmoil, to answer their prayers, to bind them to him. Please think about that scene every time we share the peace here at worship. It reminds us that we're sharing more than just a word or a handshake. We're sharing Christ himself, his blessing and peace. It is given from one sister or brother to another. It's one of the reasons that every Sunday of the church year is really a little Easter. We are sharing the presence of the risen Jesus. After bestowing upon them his peace, Jesus shows them his wounds. His wounds are his identity. And John says, when they see them, the disciples rejoice. Notice that those wounds were not erased by the resurrection. Rather, the resurrection was a way of showing that Jesus' suffering was for them. Especially in John's gospel, Jesus was born to die by his wounds they were healed by his death. They're given life. And then, a really remarkable thing. Only in John's Gospel, we're told that Jesus breathes on them, saying, receive the Holy Spirit. This is John's version of Pentecost, maybe with ascension thrown in as well, all of it occurring on that first Easter day. Think about that moment. Again, your place in it. Jesus breathes on them. What an intimate thing to do. Does it remind you, perhaps, of some other Bible passages? Remember the creation of Adam? He was just a lump of clay until that moment when God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Or that image that comes to us from Ezekiel, that vast valley of dry bones, how with a word the prophet brings the bones rattling together, and then they're covered by muscle and skin. But that isn't the end of the story. Finally, God sends into them the breath that is needed for new life. And that valley teems with life. It's interesting, I think, that in both Hebrew and Greek languages, the same word comes to have three different distinct meanings in English. It's Hebrew ruach and Greek pneuma as in pneumatic or pneumonia. Those words can mean in English either wind or spirit or breath, depending upon the context. And so think about that. The wind or the spirit 
where the breath of God blows over the turmoiling waters in the first chapter of Genesis. And then with a breath, God speaks word by word creation into existence. Think about that second chapter of Acts when there is the mighty rush of a violent wind, breath, Spirit blowing into the house where the disciples are and filling them with God at Pentecost. The ancients didn't know much about the relationship between wind, breath, spirit, but they did know this much. Only living things have that breath. When the wind stops, the breathing stops, life goes away. And so here is Jesus, the risen Jesus, breathing on them in that room to impart to them a holy new life, a new relationship with God. As the Father sends me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. That moment was evoked so wonderfully in David Himes' anthem last week. I wish we were doing it again today as well. I invite you to experience it again online. As the Father sends me, so I send you. Receive the Spirit. What goes on when you hear those words this morning? Do you find yourself inside that room with Jesus or outside looking in? I mean, do you think that that so I send you from Jesus was just intended for that little brand, band of frightened followers that night? Or, or does Jesus speak those words to us as well? John gives us a clue, I think, in his earlier account of the Last Supper. There in that long prayer that Jesus offers, he says, Father, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of all those who will believe in me through their word. Do you get it? Jesus is praying for us. By the time John writes the Gospel, maybe in the mid-90s A.D., most of the eyewitnesses would have been gone. And the church may well have been struggling with the question, what happens when there's no one left who's actually seen Jesus? Will the faith continue? Thousands of years and billions of believers later, you and I are here to answer with a resounding yes. The faith does continue. The story of Thomas is kind of a bridge along the way. You know it so well. He's absent on that first Easter Sunday when the risen Lord comes, but he's back a week later to see. The English translates him as doubting one. But that's neither accurate nor fair. The Greek word that John uses to describe Thomas is that he is without belief without trust. In other words, at that moment he's neutral, not denying or doubting. And then when Jesus shows Thomas his wounds, he declares, my Lord and my God, saying more than any of the other disciples said, we should really call him testifying Thomas rather than doubting. And he gives Jesus the occasion to take it even further, affirming the blessedness of all of those who have not seen and yet come to believe, bringing it back again to you and me. Let's think about it. Like Thomas and the others, here we are gathering a week later for meal and fellowship. I hope we're gathering also because we expect Jesus to show up. I hope that because 
The story of the empty tomb is not complete until the risen Jesus appears in the midst of those he loves. The story remains in the past about someone else unless its power is made real in the lives of those who share his gifts, spirit, breath, word, forgiveness, love. Do you recall how John begins his gospel? He writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then that Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And now at the end of the gospel, we hear that Word made flesh declare, As the Father has sent me, so I send you. John writes us into his story because he understands that by that Jesus himself is drawing us in. He comes, risen Lord, through word and water, through bread and cup, to inhabit this community to empower us with the gifts of healing forgiveness, to send us out from this place so that others can come to believe and have life in him. Do you ever find yourself doubting that in a state of unbelief? Wondering if this whole story indeed connects to us? please know that you are in good company. And like Thomas, you may be on the verge of the most profound testimony, my Lord and my God. That's why this community continues to gather. Communities all over the world gathering together, not only in Jesus' name, but where two or three gather, he is there in the midst of them. That's the promise. Jesus invites us this very morning to hear his word, to breathe deep his spirit, to know his peace, to see and touch and taste so that his body may take on flesh and blood in us. It is by the grace and work of God that we believe Doubts may well exist, and challenges certainly do. But through and in spite of them, we know that our lives are somehow being changed by this gospel message. The risen Jesus is there on our minds, in our hearts, working in what we do and say, in who we are, so that others can be drawn closer to him and to the power of his saving love. Hear it once more. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Please don't isolate that charge to the dusty streets of ancient Palestine because those words come from the lips of our living Lord this very morning to you and for you so that his life can be shared on your streets and throughout this city and around the world. John invites us in so that Jesus can send us out. May we join together once more in that marvelous prayer of the day. O God of life, you reach out to us amid our fears with the wounded hands of your risen Son. By your Spirit's breath, revive our faith in your mercy and strengthen us to be the body of your Son. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
Give your church a sure and certain hope that overcomes doubt and fear. We pray for our Covenant Congregation Christ Episcopal Church and for Father John, for the people of St. Mark's Lutheran Church and their Psalm Doug, and for the congregation and staff of Hope Lutheran Church in Reading. Fill us with the peace of Christ so that our lives proclaim your forgiveness and life. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy. Inspire the leaders of the nations to work for peace and justice in every place. Quell the rancor in North Korea. Give lasting peace to the troubled regions of the Middle East and bring an end to tyranny and oppression in all its forms. Bless those who serve in distant lands, especially Kristen Opolinsky and Jesse and Emily Rute, that they may bear witness to your everlasting love. Hear us, O oh God. Hear us, Ease the burdens of all who suffer in mind, body, or spirit especially Rendell Wolf, Jan Rita Clemenson, Nan Podiker, Bill Davidson, Brian Trump, Joan Hinkle, Pat Levenspire, Tom Spatz, Tom McMahon, Ron Gregory, Dottie Smith, Dorothy Goodikens, David Shrum, Pastor Barry Spatz, Jim Rare, Beth Evans, and those others we now name. Grant healing, companionship, and hope to all who live in fear. Hear us, O oh God. Strengthen this congregation to sing songs of hope and promise. Bless our worship and music ministries, that their leadership may inspire and strengthen our life together. Be with our vestry members as they meet tomorrow. And bless those whom we remember, especially in prayer this week. Linda Motley, Ben McKenzie, Kobe and C.J. Motley, Roger and Chris Mounts, Catherine Moyer, and Nancy Noggle. Hear us, O oh God. Fill our hearts with joy and gladness as we, we remember those who have died believing in life in your name. Reveal to us the joy of your salvation even in the face of death. Hear us, O oh God. In resurrection hope, we commend to you all for whom we pray, trusting in the promise of new life through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. 
May we share his peace with one another.